Hi, this is Dr. Centeno, and welcome to the COVID Fact Fiction Show, Episode 6. Now, if you're like me, you want to know what the medical science is behind the media narrative and the media hype. And what I have found uh, through the last five or six months of tracking COVID is that frequently there's more hype than medical science. So please share this with like-minded friends so that we can get the word out about what the medical science is versus what the media narrative is. And often they're two different things. So uh, let's start with what's up with Sweden. Uh, again, Sweden has been the bad boy of the world as a country because they decided to resist the COVID media narrative and actually tried to see if they could get to herd immunity. So they kept their schools open, they kept everything open, and they have now almost zero deaths. And there's some in the scientific community that are starting to wonder whether or not Sweden is at herd immunity. Uh, meaning the reason why we're seeing these decreased deaths is that Sweden has finally gotten there. Now, there's lots in the media that believe that that's ridiculous. They can't have that because then they can't have justified all of the crazy shutdowns, which uh, caused other issues. But I'll go into a few of those pieces today. So immunity after mild COVID. This has been a big deal because a lot of people uh, started to believe, and there was a few papers that might have sort of suggested that if you had mild COVID-19 or no symptoms, that you couldn't become immune. You had to have had severe COVID-19 or moderate COVID-19. However, we now have these four different papers which talk about different types of immunity, which all argue that people with mild or asymptomatic COVID also develop antibodies and T cell uh, immunity. So these are all yet, but most of what we had on or have on COVID right now is unpublished. So what does it take to get to herd immunity? This is a big issue right now because we've been told it takes about 70% of the population having been infected and recovered to get to herd immunity. And what is herd immunity? Herd immunity just means that there's so many people out there that have had this thing and have antibodies or T cells against it. Remember, those are the two types of immunity that you have, that the virus is more likely than not going to end up in somebody where it can't survive, so it's not going to spread. And uh, this has always been a tall order. And one of the reasons why they've been going after Sweden so hard, because Sweden believes it's gotten to maybe 20% or so immunity with antibodies. Um, but, and yet, uh, without any social distancing, without any shutting things down, without shutting down their school system, uh, their deaths have been going down, down, down. So how do you explain that? Well, interestingly enough, these guys tried to. They actually did a specific model looking at herd immunity based on the R0. So basically, uh, early in a pandemic, things spread, the R0 goes up, and then as things start to decline and you get towards herd immunity, the R0 starts to tank. And their model shows that we should be able to get to herd immunity with COVID at around 10 to 20 percent of the population having had it and having recovered. Now that's really, really interesting because right now we're really delaying that. If this is true, now it may not be true, but if this is true, we're delaying the inevitable by pushing all this stuff out, by freaking out when someone's COVID density gets above 10 percent or 5 percent or 15 percent or whatever other random number has been chosen, we are pushing this herd immunity down the road. So we're gonna see if this is true over time, but if Sweden's cases don't pick up in the fall, uh, I think this is probably more likely to be accurate than not. So let's talk about a new Corona T-cell test. I don't normally pimp any companies. I don't have anything to do 
with the company here that I'm going to talk about, only that we're starting to now see uh, the beginning of our first commercially available Corona T-cell test. And why is that a big deal? I brought it up today because what we've really been focused on has either been PCR testing of the actual virus in the nose or now a recent saliva test, or we've been focused on antibodies in the blood. The problem is we now know there's another type of immunity to the coronavirus, which is your T cells. And these are cells, unlike antibodies, that can actually just go and kill the virus because they remember the virus. So actually getting a commercially available T cell test would be huge. It would allow us to finally determine who's really immune beyond just antibodies. And so this is the company that's been working on it. This is the university they've been working with. And I just bring it up because I think it's really interesting. This could really break this whole field wide open and allow us to really understand what's going on with regard to immunity. So we all know that if we didn't shut down, we would have more people die because our healthcare systems were overloaded. Now that all makes sense. You wanna do everything you can not to overload the healthcare systems. As a doctor, obviously that makes sense to me because my colleagues are out there putting their lives on the line trying to save these people. Having said that, on the other side, when you shut down, you also cause other problems that can kill people just because the healthcare system is now different. So we're gonna talk about how many people will die due to shutdown related delayed diagnoses. And this was a recent paper in the Lancet Oncology talking about the impact of shutting down the UK in England and how that affected delayed diagnosis of cancer and these were treatable cancers. So the, these were people who were going to die because they didn't get screened and they didn't get screened because of the shutdown. Again, I have tons of patients and I know my colleagues do as well, who are just afraid to go to a hospital or a clinic and get diagnosed. So those delayed diagnoses are going to cause deaths. And this is from the paper, but basically what it showed was that there were gonna be a lot of people in just these four types of cancer, breast cancer, colorectal, lung, and esophageal cancer. And those people were going to die because they didn't get diagnosed on time because of our shutdown. Now, if we scaled it up to the US for just those four cancer diagnoses, that's about 25,000 people who will die because we shut down. Now we're gonna have to double that because that's only four types of cancers and you see all the different types of cancers there are here and how many people uh, have those issues. So let's say it's 50,000 people. We know we're going to die because we shut down simply from cancer, not of COVID. Now, again, as I've said before, the American uh, Academy of Family Physicians has, has estimated that about 150,000 people will die due to deaths of despair. So that means uh, suicide, depression, alcoholism, drug abuse. So now we're up to 200,000 deaths because of our shutdown strategy. Then if we add more, uh, things like simple heart arrhythmias that can be easily fixed through ablation or medications that are going to go undiagnosed and people will stroke out, uh, let's say due to AFib, it's probably at least another 100,000. So we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of people because we shut down, and we might lose hundreds of thousands of people if we don't shut down. So again, that's the kind of calculus and math that needs to be looked at here rather than the paranoia and panic of the media narrative. Uh, public health officials need to be looking at this whole thing and saying, here's what happens if we shut down, here's what happens if we don't shut down. That's good medicine, that's good public health policy. Uh, when the hysteria is taken out and the knee-jerk reactions of the media are taken out. 
So here's a classic, what I call panic porn. Now my wife doesn't like that term. She doesn't like the porn term. Uh, so you can call it just panic media if you'd like. But uh, this was a story in the Washington Post. Boston refused to close schools during the 1918 flu. Then children began to die. Now, this has a very clear focus, right? Uh, we are in the middle of deciding whether or not we should open schools or close them. So that's why this particular piece is here. And it's obviously trying to push parents in the direction of, of believing their kids will die if they go to school. There's no doubt about this. Uh, there's no gray area here. There's just one big problem. Uh, the 1917-1918 influenza pandemic affected preferentially kids and young people because there was no pre-existing immunity at all to that uh, that viral pathogen. So old people and middle-aged people were fine because they had pre-existing immunity. It was the young kids and young people that were dying. Now, obviously COVID-19 is the direct opposite. Uh, older people tend to get severe COVID and are at higher risk of dying. Young kids and young adults uh, have ridiculously low rates of death. In fact, their rates of death are similar to a lightning strike or getting killed by a lightning strike. So obviously that Washington Post piece is again just meant to foment panic and trying to deliver a message to try to get a result. And the result is we don't want to open schools, so let's start putting out fear pieces to get parents really afraid. The average parent isn't going to know that the 1918 pandemic was completely different. So thanks so much for watching the COVID Fact Fiction Show, uh, episode six. Again, please share this with like-minded friends, family members, so that we can get the word out about the science-based medicine behind COVID versus the crazy hysterical media narrative. And in addition to that, realize that I've now only got this Wednesday show uh, but I also have a Sunday long format blog. So if you go to covidfactfiction.com, you can sign up for both of those. So again, please share this, get this out there so that we can uh, really put a damper on the craziness. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.